So it's now three o'clock, it's time for the meditation class. And at the meditation class, it's really wonderful to be able to spend some time learning to make your mind very peaceful and quiet. And when you can make your mind peaceful and quiet, it's, uh, it does wonders for, you know, understanding yourself, understanding life, and also just learning how to make peace, first of all with your mind, and to make peace with everything else. And, oh, okay, just last night even, I just, it's weird meditation and just what uh, the benefits it can give you. You know, the last night we, we had supposed to be just a talk, just online from eight till nine. Many of you may have seen that, but during that talk I felt very tired. And then had to uh, stay up and then 11 p.m. start the, the, another little talk and meditation uh, up to midnight and then do the chanting after midnight. And it was weird, I thought, how on earth, I'm a 70 year old now, how can you manage to stay up so late when you've been busy all day? And in the end, I just started meditating. At, what was it, nine o'clock, 10 o'clock. And it's wonderful, you, I use meditation. It's better than coffee or tea just to get some energy back up inside of you. And when you get energy back up inside of you, then you sort of come to the evening session full of beans, full of energy, full of, of but nice energy. The energy which is very focused and very sharp and very, uh, to be a speaker, a little bit more entertaining, more engaging. I always put that down to the to almost the magic of meditation. And of course, that's actually how the, the Buddha taught it, that when you do meditate, one of the things which disappears is what we call like discontent and weariness, those sorts of things are not just physical. A lot of those are just, you know, from the mind. And when the mind can be peaceful and still, it's amazing just how much good energy can come up afterwards. So it took a while to get to sleep after last night. Because, not because I was wired on, on drugs or alcohol or anything else like what people do on a New Year's Eve just because I was wired on meditation. It's much better. It's peaceful, and it's powerful, and it's beautiful. It has many, many positives. So little by little by little, as we can be peaceful and calm, then we can learn just how, all the benefits of meditation. But be able to meditate, you know, first of all, we have to learn how to come into this moment, be with this, and not fight it. Too often when people start meditating, they try to control their mind. It's like a discipline in the mind. Sometimes they even call it a training. Instead of calling it a training, we can call it an understanding. An understanding of how your mind works. And a bit of courage to let it be and to let it grow, let it develop. One of my first meditation teachers told me a story. This is when I was still a lay person. He told me the story that when he was a young boy, his uh, father gave him about four or five seeds, flower seeds. And he planted these seeds in the garden in Bangkok. And he was only about, was it five or six, seven years of age or something. And when you give a kid these little flower seeds and he plants and puts them under the ground, he's so impatient. He said, when are they gonna flower? And that was about two or three hours after he planted the seeds. <laughs> and, but his father told him, look, when you have those seeds in the ground, when the water reaches them, little seeds swell, they split, and a tiny, um, a tiny plant comes up from the seed. It's called germination. And that once it starts uh, forming, it takes a while for it to push up through the soil and come to the sunlight above the surface of the soil. So just wait. And after two or three days, he found that his father was correct. A, a little green shoot, five little green shoots appeared above the soil. He was excited. He was going to see his first flowers actually grow from those seeds he planted himself. 
and day by day they grew like a half an inch, another half an inch, and, and they were still very small. And after about three days, that's when he lost his patience. He decided to stretch them all to try and make them grow faster. And when he stretched them all, <laughs> he, he destroyed all of them. But the meaning of that parable is that in your meditation, you can't stretch your meditation to make it come faster. You know, well look, it's this new year already. I've got a busy year ahead of me. I can't wait that long. I want to see some nice deep meditations this afternoon. Or I want my money back. That's one of the reasons we never charge for these events. Otherwise people will ask for their money back. It's one of the reasons why we always take off our shoes before we come in the hall, so people have got nothing to throw at us. <laughs> wow, people are laughing today, that's really good. <laughs> and so little by little, we learn just how to be patient. And patience is the fastest way in meditation. And I've been meditating for 50, almost 60 years now. No, not that long, 52 years. And all those time, sometimes I even forget to be patient. But then you just are patient and it works so beautifully. You get so deep and peaceful and energized. It's fantastic. So little by little, we learn how to meditate, be patient. And also the patience, what we call like waiting. There's those two types of waiting when we're meditating. Waiting in the present and waiting in the future. What is waiting in the future? You're waiting for something to happen. You're looking not where you are, but sometime the next minute or two minutes or three minutes or something, you're waiting in the future. And you'll find that is always unproductive. And what you're waiting for never happens. Instead, we learn how to wait on the present moment. Just like a waiter at a restaurant waits on their customers. They see what their customers need. They see you know, whether they're ready for the next course or whether you know, they need their plates cleared or they need their bill. They wait in the present moment. And when you're waiting in the present moment, putting all your attention in the present moment, how can there be impatience? To be impatient, you have to have some idea of some place you want to get to afterwards. Here it's not where you're going to get to afterwards, it's where you are now. And that is the other great thing about meditation. When you are aware of what's happening right now, and you're kind to the present moment, you find yourself going inwards. You're staying here with this moment, and little by little, you get more and more and more peaceful you tend to go inside more and more. And as you go inside more and more, there you find just, it gets more beautiful, more peaceful, more still. It's never going on to the next thing in meditation, always going in to where you are now. And that was one of the similes I gave on a Zoom retreat, which I was doing, oh, it was a long time ago, in the last year sometime, that was actually a couple of days ago. <laughs> But, but there, I just gave in the, the old, <laughs> the old um, story. Um, Venerable, do you want to just go and talk to Ken and tell him that I'll be finished about 4.15 or 4.30? And there, uh, when you are uh, on that retreat, I told the simile, one of my favorite similes, of the thousand-petal lotus. You know a lotus flower? It's closed up at night time. And in the morning, when the light and the warmth of the sun hit those outermost petals of the lotus, they start to open up. They open up little by little, bit by bit, once the warmth and light of the sun hit them. Now, here we realize that the light and the warmth of the sun, that stands for the light is mindfulness, and the warmth is the kindness. When those two hit the outermost petal of the lotus, the light and the warmth of the sun, that is where the lotus starts to open up. Layer of petal by layer of petal. 
Once the first outermost petal opens up, then the light and the warmth can hit the next layer of petals, and then it hits the next layer of petals, and that opens up, hits the next layer of petals, and you go in, 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 in to where you are. Layer after layer after layer, it opens up, and you see what's inside. And with the lotus flower, you know that uh, the deeper you go into that lotus flower, the more refined are the petals, the more fragrant are the petals, the more beautiful are the petals, the more profound are those petals. And that's the same with the body and mind which bears your name. It's incredible just how some people come and say, oh, I'm only a beginner. Oh, I can't really meditate, or I'm not really that good at meditation. They don't realize that what's right inside of them right now, the beauty and depth of your mind and inside that mind, is something which is, it is true. That when people say they've got enlightenment right inside of them, there's a good truth to that. You just got to open up, unpackage everything, see what's right inside. See what's in the heart of the thousand petal lotus. You go in to be able to find that. So little by little, you close your eyes, you be aware of your breath. Sorry, going too fast. You close your eyes, become aware of your body first of all. That's the outermost sheath of this thing which bears your name. It's what people recognize who you are. They see who you are and they think, oh, that's that person, that's Ajahn Brahm, that's Avenal Wasaga, who's with me today. That is um, uh, Bill, Prince in the background, who's always here, he's amazing. And Gus Young as well, always here to help out, amazing people. And anyway, you go inside and inside, and inside your body, what's inside the body, is again, the realm of your mind. And the first thing you get to know is time. We always say present moment awareness. But to get to that present moment awareness, become, you become aware of time and to go into the center of time, which is where the present moment is. When you go inside the present moment, you get to silence. Right inside now, it's this beautiful silence, you're not speaking. There's no comment you can make. All the comments, all the thoughts, are usually about what's happened a few moments ago or what's going to happen in the future. You can't really think about what's happening right now. You haven't got the information yet. Right now is usually very silent. And then the next thing which comes up, you go inside even further and surprise, surprise, you usually come across your breath next. And people who do breath meditation too often People go onto the breath way too soon. Not naturally, they almost go looking for the breath and capture it. Instead of capturing the breath, we let the breath come to us. Then it's a friend. We used to stay with the breath and people keep asking, what do we do next? Nothing, stay where you are. Then you go inside the breath. And inside the breath, you get the delightful breath. And inside the delightful breath, you just get the delightful. It's what we call like the nimittas, it's beautiful lights in the mind. You go inside of those. Okay, I'm gonna go all the way here to the jhanas. The next jhana is always in the side of the one you're experiencing now. One by one you go in, 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 in. Always further inside. And as you go on that path, it means you don't go out. You don't go to the next stage, you go in to find the next stage of meditation which means you're always focusing inside, 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 and you're letting go of what's on the outside. And little by little you find that's a very peaceful way. And you have to be in this moment, you have to be patient, thinking about what's going to happen next. You're just disturbing this whole process. So just, even just remembering that image of a lotus opening up with you, that lotus. And little by little you allow awareness and kindness to open you out and see what's deeply inside of you. And the last thing to say before we start the meditation 
is I can almost guarantee this, actually I'd guarantee it hundred percent, that when you actually see what's inside of you, you'll be surprised and delighted with how beautiful that is right inside of yourself. The outermost petal of the lotus may be not be encouraging, but what's inside, the deeper you go inside, is more and more beautiful, more and more delightful, more and more profound, it gives you way more understanding of the nature of this life, of you, and the world. So that's just the introduction. Uh, 3.15 now, now we can actually start the meditation proper. But I will allude to those instructions as we go through the first part of this meditation. Okay, so, for those of you who are not comfortable, please adjust. If you want to sit on chairs, you can see a lot of people are sitting on chairs. Chairs are fine to sit on. When I now have to do Zoom retreats and do guided meditation online, of course I have to sit on a chair because that's where the cameras and computers can see me. That's you know, in my room in Serpentine, in Bodhinyana Monastery. But here I sit on the floor, but I use both postures these days, sitting and also sitting on a chair or sitting on a cushion. Whatever posture you find comfortable, that's good enough. Okay, so if uh, you can now close your eyes. Please excuse me for taking my mask off so I can speak, but as soon as I stop the speaking part of this, I'll put the mask back on. So the first thing always is to sit down cross legged on the floor, or sit down on a stool. We have a few Zen stools here, I don't know if anyone is using one. but They're really great. Or you can uh, sit on a chair. Or the other posture is a few people sitting on a, a stool with your back against the wall. That's also fine. It's okay if you know, you're just laying on the ground, but please make sure you don't fa fall asleep and start snoring. So I'm just checking my own posture. And I close my eyes. And you notice if you try to be aware of your posture with your eyes open, there's more opportunity to be distracted, but also that your brain has to deal with visual stimulus. When you close your eyes, it's like one of the sense organs, sight, has been turned off. There's one less thing to deal with. And then with my eyes closed, I get a much better feeling for how my body is sitting. And even if my body feels comfortable at the beginning, I still do a quick sweep through my body. If you haven't been with me when I do this before, I usually start with my feet. The furthest part from my head, and a part which is sort of not so vital for my well-being, in the chest with all those organs there, they're very, very crucial to my health and well-being. The feet, though, I start there. So that by the time I build up the mindfulness and the kindness, by the time I get to my chest area, then it's very, very strong, and I can really help to relax everything in that area of my body. Right now my feet are not comfortable, so I'm going to just adjust my posture. Ah, that's good.
So now I go back to my feet, I was adjusting my waist belt as well. And I, the way I do this is you just ask parts of your body, how are you? How are you feet? Is, is this the way of connecting with my own feet? Being aware of them and then being kind to those feelings. Kind to the feet so that if they need to be moved, adjusted, I will do that. And even just being kind to a part of your body, it's like it gives it a sense of safety. It can loosen up and relax. You know if you're not safe, if you feel afraid, your body tenses up. When you relax, fear disappears and the body gets very loose and comfortable. And I go up my legs. First of all, going up the, the calves of the legs. It's like I'm just doing a quick check to make sure everything is okay. Then to the knees. To the thighs. And as I do this, I'm also very aware of positive sensations. Sensations of comfort and ease. I'm not just focusing on the faults in the body. Also focusing on how comfortable it feels. This allows me to relax my whole legs. And all those meditations I've done over 50 plus years, I know that that means I can meditate for long periods of time without having to move. Because I set my body up in a good way to begin with. And then I check my butt. You know, when I started meditating, I used to my legs got f kind of fell asleep. They got numb because I hadn't got myself in a good posture to begin with. And other people complain about that. When they sit down to meditate, sometimes their feet sort of go to sleep. It's it's not a dangerous feeling. It's a bit unpleasant. That never happens to me anymore because I pay attention to my butt to make sure it's comfortable sitting on the cushion. Always using kindness and mindfulness together. And I go to my back, make sure that that, I give it a stretch, which is nice. Stretch it out, it feels good, and then relax it. I learned that from seeing animals do the same in the forest. So many different species will give their back a stretch. Sometimes you see the kangaroos doing that, they put their front paws against a tree, give themselves a stretch. It makes the back feel good. And then you let go, relax, and the back is nicely relaxed. And I go through the front of my body. First of all, going through the digestive organs, just like a sweep up, see if I can think of anything there needs to be adjusted. I can feel a bit of tightness in my stomach muscles now. And if I feel any tightness there, all I do is actually just go into it and with kindness learn how to relax it. Not to squash it, not to stretch it. So that air in the body like assumes its natural state. It's not controlled. It's at ease, it's loose. And mindfulness gives you feedback. 
so you soon see if what you are doing make sure, in this case my tummy or comfortable or less comfortable that's how I learn how to relax my own body at the same time I'm strengthening my mindfulness and kindness as I go further up the body to the lungs and your heart if you missed out anything it's because that part of the body is just quite peaceful for me right now so you get to right to the top of your your torso that's where the stomach the, that's where this the uh, shoulder muscles are and people do get pain in their shoulders if they don't relax those muscles when they start meditating so I make a point of loosening both ends of each shoulders imagining that they're like two bunches of strings on either side of the spine being stretched and I imagine them being stretched and I imagine them letting go so there's no tension on my shoulder muscles they're loose and at ease you go your, down your arms, past your elbows and wrists to your hands and when I can s focus on my hands on the feelings in them with my eyes closed I can feel I can put them in a better position so I do so now a position of more comfort, comfort of more sustainable comfort I'm kind to my own hands, I don't exploit them, I don't try and train them I don't try and make them tough I'm kind to them and they respond by being at peace and I go back up to my shoulders and my neck making sure there's no irritations in the neck if there is I just check by just doing a couple of like twisting my head rocking it back and forth until I can find the best position for my head on top of my neck if the head is not properly balanced on top of the neck of course you will get tensions and then pains in your neck muscles and shoulder muscles too so I learn how to balance my head on top of the neck then lastly I go to the front of my face and there I relax any tightness around my eyes any tension around the mouth or the forehead or anywhere you learn how to do that, you can feel there might be some tightness there can you imagine like a string being pulled apart, stretched you just let go of both ends and the string becomes loose that becomes my face now relaxed to the max and then I try to be aware of the whole body as a single unit instead of just being aware of the parts when I do this my body feels just so at ease it's relaxed and when I can perceive how relaxed my body is it feels delightful, it's the joy of physical relaxation which is real and when you indulge in that pleasure of physical relaxation you delight in it your body relaxes even more and that's great for your health and it gives you one of the first rewards for learning how to practice mindfulness and kindness and this time on your own body
because if you can perceive the delight of relaxation, it is the pleasure of this meditation path. It means you don't have to force the mind. The mind enjoys it. And it stays with the object of the delight of a relaxed body. And after a short while you start to become aware of some of the mind states. You go inside your lotus, inside the mind. So inside the body is your mind. One of the first things you will notice is how the mind goes off to the past and the future or stays in the present. To go inside of time to its center, the present moment. We have to learn how to be kind to the past if it comes up. Be kind to the future if it comes up. Because loving kindness solves problems. We give people who hurt us the benefit of the doubt. Let it be, forgive. We give ourselves kindness. Why you did that, why you said that, who knows? But you forgive and learn. And kindness to the future. Don't always think it's going to be bad. Be kind. And when you're kind to the present moment, just like when you are kind to the body, the body can relax and feel delightful. When you're kind to the present moment, your present moment becomes easy to be with. And it's nice to be with, it's delightful. <coughs> That's how you come easily into the next stage of the lotus, the present moment awareness. Not forced, it naturally happens. And that is beautiful. And hopefully, from the present moment awareness, when it's ready, you will notice yourself going even deeper in to silence. There's no words, no descriptions, not taking notes. You're just feeling, aware, just knowing. And there doesn't need to be any force. Because by this stage, the delight, the joy of being now, being silent, is what should attract you. Keep your attention in this silence. Because it feels nice. And to see just how you can go deeper and deeper into this moment. Deeper and deeper into silence. Eventually deeper into the breath. Deeper into the delightful breath. And always remembering the next stage is right within what you're experiencing right now. Stay here. I will now be quiet. When I start speaking again, it'll be close to the end of the meditation. Every meditation, uh, you may know that uh, this is always live streamed overseas.
So we usually have quite a few questions from overseas. So we can get the first overseas question first, and then I'll see if anybody from here wishes to ask a question. Thank you. First from the United States. How to meditate to heal when you have a chronic condition? I am trying many medications until now, but nothing is helping my condition to lessen. Please let me know your thoughts. It's very worthwhile. You have a chronic condition, but even though you have chronic health conditions, those are usually bodily conditions. And it's something which the Buddha once said, that even though the body is sick, the mind doesn't need to be sick. They're almost like two separate realms of existence. So if you can learn how to go deep inside the meditation, and then when you go into the realm of the, the mind, you get closer, it allows so many healings to happen. Sicknesses which were chronic disappear. And we've done this before, and we get lots and lots of people just come up and say, and one of the ones which we heard years ago was when a lady with, I think she was in Eastern Europe, Poland probably, she had a chronic arthritis, and getting worse and worse and worse. And a very sort of bad prognosis. And what she did was just out of desperation, because nothing was working. So she did this meditation method, and it worked for her. It doesn't work for everybody, but it worked for her. And she sent this beautiful email. Thank you. I can have a life back now. So, when you have a chronic medical tradition, medical condition, thing to do is see if you can go inside of it to its center. Don't run away from it. Learn from it. Go inside of it. It's a tough thing to ask, but when you do that, after a while, that chronic medical condition can, it's almost like its karma has been exhausted. It's done its job. You've learned its lesson. Now you don't have to have it again. And one of the examples of that is, again, Ajahn Chah. Because remember him telling me, and I've got no reason to doubt this either, you know, because he was a forest monk in those days, that every forest monk got malaria. Just you know what you have to get used to. Fortunately, that when I was a forest monk, I never got malaria. I got other things, but not malaria. But um, when he did get malaria, it was just big fevers and wears you out, and then you know, you recover, then go back to your meditation again. But this time, he decided in the middle of, of an attack of malaria to actually to meditate. And go, he said, he described the experience going right inside the center of it. And in the center it was cool. He knew he had malaria, the malaria was on the outside, like encircling him. But, you know, he was inside where it was safe and calm and peaceful. And he just stayed there and he could feel the heat from the fever get hotter and hotter and hotter. The malaria fever was really getting hot and then it exploded, that's what he said. And after it exploded, he had no more malaria fever ever again. And that's a powerful thing to say, but these things happen. If you do have a chronic illness condition, don't just decide, oh, I'm just going to give up all the medication and, and just uh, rely upon some spiritual um, people like myself. Don't do that. Use this as a complementary and just see if this is all you need. For some people it does work, not for all people, but it's worth a go. And that's actually how you meditate to heal. You just go right inside of it. It takes some courage. A lot of time you've got no choice. It hurts anyway, so let's go right inside. And see if you can find that place right inside the pain or the fever or the inflammation, right inside of it, where it doesn't hurt you and there the mind can relax the whole body. Okay, next question. Any questions from the floor here? From people actually here? No, okay. We'll do the next question here. Yeah. Okay. 
uh, from New Zealand. I have heard Ajahn Brahm mention ping pong jhanas. Can you please explain this a bit more, Ajahn? Okay, just the idea of ping pong meditation, ping pong jhanas. It's what, when you get into a deeper state of meditation, you're going deeper into those uh, the lotus flower, which was a simile for you, and it surprises you. Or, you know, you get too excited or too afraid. And then you go in, but then you tense up or you uh, react and you come out again. But, you know, you're pretty peaceful and still, so you go back inside again. It's like bing, 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 bing. And that's a ping pong challenge. You don't stay there very long. And that is not uncommon, but at least it gives you a taste of what's possible. The next time, if you go inside those deep meditations, shh, relax. Don't do anything. You're going inside your lotus, a nice, beautiful layer of petals opens up and closes up almost instantaneously. Why? If you want to know what the Buddha said about that, there's a whole sutta about that, the Upakilesa Sutta. And I mention that because this is not commentarial Buddhism, this is not sort of made up by Najan Baba or Najan Shah. This is how the Buddha experienced things. But little by little, after you go deep inside and come out afterwards, sooner or later, you'll have the guts to stay longer and longer and longer. The simile I used years ago was like, you take, because there's a few kids here today, they're welcome, they're very good, well done, kids, you are quiet, marvellous. And there's, uh, you take a kid who's just learned how to walk, take him to the swimming pool for the first time, and there's this water, and they get scared of water. In one of the kids here, I'm just going to give them a blessing with holy water. Ooh, it's only water, for goodness sake, it's not going to kill you. But they were scared of it. You can understand why, because kids are just learning about the world. And they don't know what's going to happen next, and so of course there's a bit of fear there in the small bodies. So you take your kid to the swimming pool for the first time. Oh, I don't want to go in that. They just learn how to walk on solid land. Imagine what it must be like. So then you just, you know, get their foot and just let them put their foot sitting on the side of the pool, put their foot in the pool, just quickly, and come out again afterwards. So that's okay. It doesn't hurt. And actually it's quite nice. So they put their foot in there a bit longer. It doesn't ping pong out so quickly. It's a ping, and then a pong. <laughs> and then they put maybe half a leg in, up to the knees. Quickly take it out again, stay there a bit longer. Then they put the whole leg in, then you put two legs in. But only quickly and take out afterwards, they feel safe. And then the kid jumps into the swimming pool and he can't get them out again. They're having too much fun. And that's just like deep meditation. When you first come across it, fear, oh, this is a bit much for me. But then you come out quickly. The next time you go again a little bit more, it's okay, you can come out again if you want to. You go in a bit further and then come out. And after a while, once you get into it, you don't want to come out. You're having a wonderful time. From Korea. I sometimes feel hot and uneasy after meditation session. Is it normal? Am I doing something wrong? I have, I've had that feeling for a long time and I get paranoid. Getting paranoid is wrong. <laughs> but you get hot in meditation. If it's really you've got a fever or something, then it must be that you, know, you need to go and see doctor. But if it's just you know, those pleasant uh, feelings of warmth, especially in a place like Korea at this time of the year, it's pretty cold in there, in Korea. I remember going to Korea and it was freezing, snow everywhere, South Korea. But so if uh, you feel hot and uneasy, I think the uneasiness is the reaction to feeling hot. If it's really just warm and hot, just fine, just let it be. Don't feel uneasy about it. And then after a while, it's just the body doing its thing. The body doing its thing, it's again healing energy most of the time. It's just the way the body heals. It puts a lot of energy into one place, or even the whole body, and it gets lots of energy going up. And then it will just heal your body and make it feel good. Now we do have global warming. We don't have meditation warming, no bodily warming. So it's pretty safe. 
Nasli from Rajesh from California. How do I overcome restlessness and dullness occurring together? <laughs> Any tips to deepen contentment? Any tips on take, taking or talking mindful highway over slothful alley? It's so you have oops um, dullness and restlessness occurring together. Now, usually it means that dullness and restlessness come after one another pretty quickly. Because that's, remember, those experiences which I had. Getting up really early in the morning in Thailand because you had to, four, no, three o'clock in the morning there, you're only allowed to sleep four hours or four and a half hours, I managed to sneak in. And getting up really early, sleep deprived, the food was terrible, so it was not nutritious at all. And then the heat was stifling, and so I was so tired in the morning. I found out it was nothing wrong with me, nothing wrong with my meditation. It was just that it was just uh, physically there was an impediment there. And I found that out because I had to uh, do my visa, renew my visa to stay in Thailand down in Bangkok. And the place we stayed, they had an air conditioner there. It was Bangkok and there's much more nutritious food. And I, oh, I honestly, I must confess, I never got up at three o'clock in the morning when I was in Bangkok. You see, I slept in four o'clock. <laughs> was that indulging? Because <laughs> I needed some more sleep. I was a young man, I wasn't getting enough sleep. And then, in an air-conditioned room, having had enough sleep, good um, food, I found I didn't have any sloth and torpor. I realized it was because physically there was a problem there. And, you know, I was born in UK. I wasn't used to the hot, stifling heat in Thailand. So because of that, I realized the sloth and torpor was not a fault in meditation. It was just physically I needed some more stuff in my stomach and needed a cooler climate. So little by little you realized that fighting nature just makes it worse. So instead I understood the causes. And then instead of fighting sloth and torpor, I just was mindful of it and kind to it, the kindfulness. And that is, because I mentioned it already, just last night at 9.30 or something when the talk finished, I went back to my room, had to come back out here by 11 p.m. Sorry. That's better. Had to come out by 11 p.m. And then, of course, when I started meditating, I was very dull. I was tired, sleepy. But I know now, don't fight. Because if you fight, just the sleepiness keeps carrying on. And if the sleepiness or dullness does disappear, it's usually replaced by sloth and torpor. So it, it was sloth and torpor to begin with. It's replaced by restlessness. You start thinking, 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 thinking. Then you slow down the thinking, and then it's replaced by sleepiness. You go between those two extremes of sleepiness and restlessness. Dullness and thinking too much. That is obviously not the right way. So instead, years and years ago, I realized just to be with my sleepiness, with the dullness. Stop discriminating against sleepiness. That's what I used. I have a right to be sleepy. I have a right to be dull. Just, and this was from somebody in California, USA. You have many rights in California. Demand the right to be slothful and, torp and torpid. And if you do things like that, it is actually a positive outcome happens. Because you're not fighting, you're making peace, you're being kind to the dullness. The dullness can't last very long. I know that many times, so that's what happened even to me last night. You're very sort of dull at first, and then you wake up, you don't do anything. You just watch this mindfulness increase in its strength and power. And of course it's so, becomes so strong, you can't be slothful or, or torpid 
but it's strong enough to keep you still. So you're not restless, you find that middle way. And that middle way you always find between slothfulness and restlessness by using kindfulness. You're aware of this moment, not very much, but you're kind enough to let it be. And you don't discriminate, don't think of it as a personal failing or a fault. And little by little, the energy comes back. It comes back and comes back and comes back and it surprises you how powerful that mental energy can be. So that's the, my answer to that question for you. How to overcome restlessness and dullness occurring together? They never really occur together, but they come fast after one another. And deepen contentment by practicing mindfulness and kindness. And after a while you find you can be content with anything. Anything is beautiful and easy to be content with. You see the, the benefits, the pleasures in the simple things of life. Okay, any questions from the floor here? Any questions from the cushions? He's not sitting on the floor. Any questions from the chairs? Going, going. Okay, that means that no one will be lining up afterwards to ask questions. <laughs> of course you do. That's fine. So thank you for coming today. And uh, thank you for behaving really, really well. And I must admit, I was impressed today uh, by the number of people here, but also by the kids. You know, there was this one kid years ago, she started coming here when she was only about seven years of age. And every Saturday afternoon she would sit perfectly still. And, you know, that was years and years and years ago. And she always would keep coming here and coming here and coming here and coming here. And I remember this Bianca at the time, that she saw she came so regularly that she made a special meditation cushion just for little Sarah. About half the size of the big ones. And I remember when she presented little Sarah with this meditation cushion. Sarah was just so overjoyed, crying and just gave uh, Bianca a huge big hug. It was really sweet. So if the kids want to come, if you can sit very still for a long time, who knows, one day you may get your own special meditation cushion. <laughs> okay, so now let's pay respects to the Buddha Dhamma Sangha.